So I want to talk to you today being marked for a miracle. We can be marked for a miracle. The pastor's been talking about how the Holy Spirit, the one that lives inside of us, who leads and guides us, if we just listen to him. That Even Jesus said, when he comes, he's going to bring the truth of my word back to you. You say, well, I haven't really heard it. You know, sometimes God still gives it to you in the time of need. But that word of his that's down inside of us, the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. And when it comes time for him to activate we can be marked for a miracle because of how we've lived, how we've walked, how we've got the word inside of us, and we can have that that we need in our life. So that's what I want to be talking about, and not the IRS marking us, but God marking us for a miracle, marking us for deliverance, that it'll happen for us if we just believe we shall receive. So turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Yeah. Verse 21, Acts 14, 21. The Bible says that when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples. Sounds like to me that people were getting born again, right? What the songs and the things we're about today, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, that through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders at every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I thank you, Father, that your word is truth. It will not lie. It will return to you and do that that you intended for it to do. And I pray, God, that you will touch our hearts today. Allow me to say something, God, that would encourage someone that needs a miracle, that needs to be touched today. God, that they can receive what they need today simply by believing what your word declares unto us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. We find here there's five things that took place, at least five, in, this, in these three verses that I just read. We find that they were preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and that they were also teaching people the word of God. And they were confirming the souls that were brought into the kingdom that the disciples had led to Jesus Christ. And then they were ordaining elders in each of the churches. That was, they were setting up leadership. Every place they, the people were born again, they set up a church, they set up the leadership so that those people would have someone to help them and to lead them. They had prayer and fasting as they commended to the elders and to the Lord. And we do that here. People just recently, when an elder or something is placed into the body, they have prayer over them, lay hands upon them, set them in. And then we find that they were doing something that is very important, and that's what the pastor does. That's what all the discipleship classes are about, and that is exhorting them to continue in the faith. Don't quit. Don't stop. We find out when, when we come to the Lord that there, most of the time we come to the Lord and the enemy will do everything he can to come against us, destroy whatever God has done, try to tell us it wasn't, you were really not saved. If you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and you spoke in other tongues, I'll guarantee the devil will tell you, that's not you, that's not God. And, and we have to then continue in the faith and believe God just like we trusted him to be saved. Now, one thing that is needed in the church, which thank God we have it in our bulletins again, there's going to be some time of organized prayer for the entire body. But I believe that one thing is needed in the church is teach people how to pray. I know there's a lot of times we go somewhere and say, someone will say, hey, how about pray? And you go ahead and pray. And they look at you and their face turns a little red and and they'll say something like this. Well, you go ahead. I really don't know how to pray. And you think, don't know how to pray. You want to say to them, what? What's wrong with you? You've been a Christian 10 years. You don't know how to pray? Come on. All you got to say is a prayer. And so I, I got a little thing, you know, uh, an evangelist taught Michael, our son, a little prayer. And we were in a big restaurant and full of people. And, and this uh, evangelist uh, 
Evangelist uh, DeGrotto was his name. He, he said, Mike, you go ahead and pray. So he taught Mike a prayer after the services at night. We'd get a bite to eat, and he taught Mike this prayer. And Mike blurted out. He just stood up and as loud as he could said, God, bless this lunch as we munch and crunch. Or bless this bunch as we munch and crunch on this lunch. And sit down. So that's something, if you don't know how to pray, when someone asks you to pray over dinner or something, just say, Lord, bless this bunch as we munch and crunch on this lunch. But uh, we need to know how to pray. Now, my parents taught us to pray when we were just real little. And it was necessary for us. Prayer was no doubt one of the most important things around our house. Um, we didn't have a lot of things. And we were taught as very young children to, to know that God would hear us when we pray. So we were supposed to pray. I remember one time when I went to Jane Addams School up in Drexel, that uh, every day when we got out of school, if it was winter time, it was worse. Uh, every day I got out of school, there was a couple guys that would chase me. They were little black boys. And they would chase me and get me down, rub my face in snow and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a very good, and I, my grandpa would come up and meet me and he'd chase the boys off. And, uh, and uh, back then it was a racial thing. And, you know, they'd call me all kinds of names, but they found out my daddy was a preacher and then that's why they were really after me to be the truthful. And, uh, and you know, my grandpa told me one day, he said, well, Raymond says, what we're going to do is we're just going to pray that God change all this stuff and you won't be coming out the same time they do. You know, after he said that and he prayed with me, those boys never bothered me again. They never, they never chased me. They never ran after me. They never said anything. So prayer works. And I want to thank God for praying parents. I really thank God for them. You know, there was times when we didn't have much food, but when they had prayed, the food would have come in. Somehow people would bring food to knock on our door and say, here, we brought this to you. I remember when we were young, there's five of us children. I don't, rem I don't really remember when I was young ever going to the doctor when I was just little, never. Because why? My folks believed in prayer. They'd lay their hands on us and pray. They didn't say, let's go to the doctor. They couldn't afford to go to the doctor anyhow. So what they would do is they'd pray, and guess what? We'd be healed. Our bodies would change. The things that was wrong would happen. If we had a need, our folks would pray. They'd gather us all around and say, we're going to pray. We need this. And guess what happened? Why? Because they prayed. They trusted God for our needs. And it happened. And uh, we need to get back to that. I'm, I'm afraid in the age that we live, there, there are possibly uh, many children that don't have that legacy of a praying mom and dad. They can't tell you stories of how mom prayed for something because a lot of times they don't hear that. So they never had that opportunity to witness a God who would just answer someone saying, God, I need you to come and help me. And that God would come. They, they haven't had that. And so uh, what have they heard? I got to thinking about this. This generation right now of young people and, and young children, if they're paying attention to what's going on in this world, uh, I believe that they've witnessed something like impeaching of the president, senators and congressmen and governors indicted and sent to prison because of corruption. They probably have heard and mom and dad talk about the policeman that was killed in the light of duty because the people of our day don't have any respect for authority. And I'm afraid to hear more of that than they do about the goodness of God and praying about God. And it's sad that that would happen in, some, in, in, in people's lives and in their homes. In some cases, then, those people have a situation that would take them to the church. And it's sad to say that even those that are supposed to be the spiritual leaders, many of them are not preaching and teaching the Word of God. They're not doing what they're supposed to do in the pulpit of God. Even in their classes and training classes, they're not really teaching the truth and the fullness of God. And we find that even some of the people that are supposed to be the leaders are worshiping everything but God. And some of them are being caught and they're going to be being sent to prison. And so this is kind of what we see in our world. It's a world right now that needs Jesus. 
It's a world I believe that we're approaching a great revival and an influx of souls coming to the church and to this church. Remember, I tell you about every time I get up here, there's prophecies about this place that has not come to pass yet. This place is not full like it, 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 some of these prophecies have told. There's not been people bringing cots and wheelchairs that's lined up up front here. And the preaching of the word and the singing and worshiping. Listen to me now. Some of these prophecies, they just burn inside of me. I, I desire to, so to see them happen. And they will happen if we'll just believe God. It, he, he has marked this place. Most of you know before the place was hardly even open that two angels came and sat out here on the roof and another one was in the air coming. And, and you know, so God has placed this place here for a reason. Now let me tell you about these people that were down here in this vision that was seen. No one laid hands on them. I believe one of the problems in the, in the area of church and the move of God is too many men and women want to take the... The, all the glory for what's going on. God won't have that anyhow. It must go to Him. And while we were just worshiping and praising God, these people were leaping out of their wheelchairs and off of the cots. Folks, I look for that. Why? For they were marked for a miracle. They believed God. That's why they came. You got six folks, bring them to church. Believe God. Tell them about the Word of God. And when they come, they'll be marked for a miracle. Guess what that will do? That'll cause this place to erupt. That'll cause this place to fill up. People will come because Jesus is here. Tell them, come and see a man. He's not Ken Harbaugh. He is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He may be working through other Harbaugh, but he'll be here. And people will be set free. I say, God, uncover every one of the ungodly. Just uncover them. Get them out of the way. God said in 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? We know what the end will be. But we God's people need to pray. We need to take authority over the abomination of the enemy, even in the church area. I'm not going to say the church of God, of Jesus Christ, because those people, I don't know, I couldn't really consider them as God's people that act that way. But we need to tear down all the tabernacles of wickedness that we see in the spirit realm, that we see according to the word of God. All the idols and, of sin and uncleanness. That is, I just read yesterday again, last night, I saw on the internet where, I don't remember even what denomination it is right now, but they just ordained another lesbian woman into the, the priesthood. Folks, that's abomination to the word of God. And we need to take authority over that kind of stuff. I remember the guy down on Loam Avenue. You've heard me tell this, but it comes to me. So Jim the Greek was his name. He was a man that lived close to the church. Very seldom come to church. Miss Edith knows who I'm talking about. And uh, he came to church one night and he came up to the altar area. And during the altar service, my mother was standing close by him just standing there praying. And she was praying in the Holy Ghost. Good to pray in the Holy Ghost once in a while. And she was praying in the Holy Ghost. And after the service, Jim the Greek come to her and said, Miss Rothwell, talk to me in some Greek some more. She said, I don't know any Greek. Oh, yes, you do. You talked to me a while ago in Greek. When we were up there, she said, well, what did I say? She said, well, you told me to go down and take my idols off of the wall and worship the true and living God. She said, then that's probably what you ought to do. <laughs> so, if God can do that, there are idols in people's lives. There are people who are worshiping things that are not of God. And I want to tell you, through prayer, through the move of the Holy Ghost, those people can be set free. If you have anything in your life today that's above God, you're worshiping that more than God. Could be anything. Bring it to God. Let God take care of it for you. 
Now, on the other side of all this stuff, we really need to lift up those who will not compromise and who will not bow down to the idols of this world. As I tell you again every time I'm up here, please pray for your pastor every day. You will never know unless you fill that office in the church of Jesus Christ, the attack of the enemy. You'll never understand it. So I ask you, pray every day. Pray every day for him. Pray for those who will lift up their voices to cry out against the abomination of things that's going on in this world and even in the church. When God's people do these things, I know that we're going to be marked for a miracle. When we do what God really asks us to do and obedient to his word, we are marked for a miracle. I hope I can get that in your brain. It's like some of these songs you wake up and you can't get them off your mind. I hope you get this marked in your mind and your spirit. I'm marked for a miracle. I'm marked for deliverance. I'm marked because God's going to bless me. He's going to meet my need. He's marked me already. And if I'll just trust him, he's going to do it for me. In the book of Judges chapter seven, when God chose Gideon, to pick out a total of 300 soldiers to fight a great mass army of the Midianites. And guess what? They, they, you know, they, they worked day after day getting all their things ready. No, all they used was a trumpet and a lamp. Sometimes God uses some of the simplest little things that can deliver us and set us free. And he'll always be there if we'll just allow him to enter into our lives. So when you see this with Gideon, God did the rest of the battle. He fought the battle for them. He defeated the enemy. But in the natural, it looked like it could never happen, that they'd never win this battle. But see, Gideon and his army were definitely marked for a miracle because Gideon was faithful to do what God asked him to do, even though it seemed ridiculous. It may seem ridiculous what God asks you to do, but friend, stand on his word, stand on what he asks you and do what he says, and you'll be marked for a miracle. Guess what? After the miracle comes testimony. Testimony to guess what God did for me. And then somebody else says, oh, he'll do that for them. He'll do that for me. Now they start believing for their miracle and claiming that they are marked of God and they'll be marked of God and God will touch them. What about the three Hebrew children that ended up in a big old fiery furnace because they wouldn't listen to King Nebuchadnezzar and do what he wanted to do to bow down and worship his idol. They wouldn't do that. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. So the old king says, okay, guys, if you're not going to listen to me, Hey, you fellas over there, heat that furnace seven times hotter. It got so hot when they went to throw the three Hebrew children in, the people that threw them in died. It was so hot. But this story is so much talks about being marked for a miracle. They did what God wanted them to do. They stayed obedient to God. They didn't fall to the need of the man who said, then you're going to die. They still didn't fall to that. They stuck to the gospel. They stuck to the word of God. And we find that when they, they made the furnace hotter, and you can read the story. I'm not going to read the stories today. I never would get finished. But they, they looked in. He looked in there and he said, hey, come over here. Didn't we only throw three guys in here? He said, oh, yeah. He said, hey, I see four in there. One of them looks like the son of God. Oh, it must be him. I want to tell you, if you get thrown into a fiery place in your life, Jesus will always be there if you just allow him to be there. He won't leave you by yourself. He'll be there to help you to come out of that furnace. And when they came out, I want to tell you, he, they were not even sins. They couldn't even smell smoke on their clothes. Oh, that's just a fairy tale. That's, that's the truth of God. And sometimes we don't receive what we need because we don't believe. Because it might seem so ridiculous. But it is true. He promised to keep them from destruction of that furnace. They just wouldn't bow down to the enemy. Guess what? You and I, we may get into a fiery furnace experience. It may be that we just don't know what to do, where to turn to, who to call, whatever. But if we have been faithful, now we have been faithful, not that we're going to be. 
Oh, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. I'll serve you the rest of my life. No, you already set that. You've already told him you're going to serve him. I'm going to live according to your word. And when you have, he's promised to keep you from the destruction of that fiery furnace. He didn't say he's going to keep you out of the furnace situation, but he's going to keep you from being destroyed during that thing. <clears throat> so we find that, you know, this is how God works. And uh, what about Daniel? Who they said the king put out a decree and said, nobody can pray except to me. They can't pray. They only have to pray to me. And Daniel said, I'm not praying to you. So he went ahead and prayed. We all know that. that all of a sudden, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And, uh, but he obeyed God. He, he didn't give up on God. And uh, so when he was thrown into that lion's den, all of a sudden, the, the king went down the next morning. And guess what? I think he knew that Daniel was some kind of a different guy. Because if he threw him in there knowing that the lions were going to kill him, he wouldn't have went down and said, hey, Daniel, you in there? He even knew this guy was a man of God and God's going to take care of him. And sure enough, found him asleep with his head on one of the lions in the lion's den. Now, God didn't tell us he'd keep us out of the lion's den. We may end up there one day. Something may happen. We may feel like we're in the lion's den. But even if we get there, he promised to mark us for a miracle. We'll just serve him, believe him, trust him, and he'll deliver you out of the power of the lions. See, the lions can't really harm you if you're trusting God. They may be around. They may growl at you and chase you and try to harm you, but it won't work. It won't work. See, God wants to mark his people for a miracle of deliverance and a miracle of healing, whatever the need is. And so keep that in your mind. Satan also wants to mark people. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says that Satan, he's moving around like a roaring lion. And he's trying to what? He's trying to deceive you and he's trying to come against you and he's trying to devour you. I feel sorry for those who don't know Jesus. For the time's coming when the trumpet will sound and dead in Christ shall rise first and those that remain shall be caught up with them in the air. And then there's going to be a time that people are going to be here and there's going to be a guy that will come in to reign in this world called the Antichrist. And he'll be giving marks too. You have to take a mark in your forehead and a mark in your hand. If you don't, you can't even buy food for your family. Your children will starve because you can't buy anything. You can't do anything. And that's a mark of the Antichrist or a mark of the beast or the mark of Satan. So, you know, you know, even today, before that Antichrist here, the spirit is here, but he hasn't arrived yet. So Satan's trying to mark you. But please don't listen to him. Please just shove him aside. Said if you rebuke him, he'll get behind you. Just call him to just leave me alone. Get back to the word of God. Just read the word of God. Let the word of God get in your heart and let God mark you for a miracle. He'll destroy the enemy in your life for you if you will let him. But those today, if you're even here today and you're putting your trust in anything else but God. See, some people have money this time and age that we're living in. And money is kind of their God. And they, put, they think they can do anything because, hey, they got a few bucks in their pocket. And if anything happens, I'm, I'm going to be okay. But uh, you're either putting your trust in Almighty God or you are putting your trust in something else. One or the other. You only have two choices. And uh, the, if you put your trust in God, the God of silver, the God of gold, the God of plenty and all the, the notoriety or whatever may be in your life, and you rely on that, I'm guarantee you, according to this Bible, that that stuff is going to crumble one day and you're going to be left with nothing. And then what are you going to do? 
say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, in Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 19, the Bible says this, they shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it's a stumbling block of their iniquity. So the money has become sin to them. And now it won't help them, so they're throwing it in the streets. The Bible actually says it's going to take place, and it will take place. So we must trust God to mark us for a miracle of deliverance, a miracle of being set free. We, we must do the things that will cause Him, to cause God to mark us. And if we do these things, to be obedient to his word, to keep his message of love and forgiveness going forth. It's just as important to be born again as it is to continue the message of the gospel to your neighbors and to your workplace and school and wherever you go. Why? Because even when he told them to go and, and tarry in Jerusalem and the gift of the Holy Ghost would come, he said, this gift will come that you might be what? Witnesses. Witnesses for me. It's just not the blessing that we receive and the mark that we receive for blessing of miracles or deliverance. It's he wants us to continue the message of the gospel. When something happens good to us through God, we need to go tell the people about it. Share with them, this is what God has done for me. He touched my life. He healed me, whatever he's done. So, you know, during the time of Elijah the prophet, the cycle of sin and forgetting God was rampant and it's repeated often after one generation after another and it got so bad until the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. I know you've heard those two names if you've been in church that they destroyed the altars of prayer. They, they disintegrated and desecrated and tore down the altars of God. But instead of just stopping there, they went ahead and then they initiated a, a worship of Baal, of worshiping Satan himself. I don't know how true it is. If it is true, folks, we really need to pray. But I saw uh, supposed to be one of the leaders in the church world that Yesterday I saw it. If I, I almost hesitate to repeat it because if it, if it isn't true, thank God. But if it is, oh, we need to pray that that leader of a large church denomination declared that Jesus Christ was a son of Satan. Folks, we're in a day that we need to realize Jesus is coming soon. The things that Jesus said would happen in Matthew's gospel is right before our face. We don't have much time. I heard Brother Jeff Rotz this morning tell the Sunday school class, I don't want him to come right now because I got loved ones that I need to get saved. Well, I can say to Brother Jeff and to all of us, folks, we don't have much time. Maybe we better go to our loved ones quickly and tell them, hey, you better look and check your life out because folks, I, I see something in this world that's happening that's according to this word that Jesus really could come anytime and these things could move so quickly that we wouldn't have an opportunity tomorrow to tell somebody about Jesus. So we need to do what we need to do because here in the Old Testament it tells us in 1 Kings that Ahab he was so wicked that he began to do all these things. He became a murderer. He murdered people. He had people worshiping Satan. And then God sent Elijah to deliver a message to him. God will always send a message. If I had time, I could tell you some stories that I personally know about of preachers that you read about. If you read in some of the books and hear stories of men of God who fell. I could tell you some stories about those people that how that God sent people to deliver them. That God loved them so much. Jim Jones, you know Jim Jones. Five men of God were sent to Jim Jones. Begged him, listen, turn from where you're at. Get back to where you were in God. And he told them to get away. I don't want to talk to you. And look what happened to his life. And look what he done to other people's life. See, God is a deliverer. God is love. If you've done something wrong, he isn't somebody up there shoving you away. His arms are open and say, come on back. I, I love you. I want to forgive you. Please come back. 
And if you'll do that, he'll mark you for a miracle. And deliverance can come to your heart and life. And you can be set free if you'll only do that. So God sent his man and said, listen, there's going to be a famine come upon this land. He didn't care. But Elijah, he obeyed God. Remember, if you obey God, do what God asks you to do. What's he going to do? He's going to mark you for a miracle. So we find Elijah doing that. All the crops burn up. Everything burn up. There's nothing. Even the king went out of his palace and went out to try to find something for his cattle and stuff. Couldn't find anything. Everything was dried up. So it became so bad that even when God sent Elijah to the brook and the ravens fed him, all of a sudden the ravens quit feeding him. Let me tell you something though. If the supply runs out, God always has something else for you if you'll just trust him. If you don't bellyache and complain, he'll send something else, some other way to secure you and sustain you. So what did he do? He said, I want you to leave this brook. Now it's kind of hard to leave the place where you God's been blessing you with food, right? And there's a famine, nothing to eat. He said, you leave this place and you, you go up the Seraphath and there'll be a widow lady that you can meet there. And that lady will bless you. She'll sustain you because I've already set her up for you. So what did he do? He went, he, he, he went to Seraphath. When he got there, he walked into town. Who was the first person he saw? This woman picking up sticks. Who was she? She was the widow that God had prepared for, for Elijah to talk to. She's picking up sticks and he said, hey, go get me a, a, something to drink. I'm thirsty. I've had a rough travel here. And, but he says, you know, the thing is, what I want you to listen to in, in this scripture, if you would read the word of God about it in 1 Kings 17, it says that God told him, I will use that widow lady to sustain you. So he says, now, when she walked away from him, he said, hey, and by the way, Make me a cake to eat. I'm hungry too. She said, oh, I don't, I, I just have a little bit of meal and just a little bit of oil and a cruise. I, I, I'm coming out here to get these sticks so I can go back and prepare just a meal for my son and I and we're going to die. He said, no, you go in there and make me a bake cake first and bring it back. Now the lady was obedient, wasn't she? The word of God tells us she was obedient. She did that. Now remember that word sustain. She said, I'm going to sustain you through this lady, he told Elijah. And so this meal and this oil is kind of like Pastor was saying the other day with the fishes and the bread. It just keeps multiplying. It keeps multiplying. All of a sudden, this little bit of, of meal, it, it didn't imply she's going to sustain you and give you one one, your last meal, you're going to have your last supper, buddy. This is it. It didn't really sound that, but it said he will, she will continue to feed and keep you alive as long as it's necessary. And so that's what began to happen. And uh, in 1 Kings 17, 12, here's what she said. As the Lord liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. She had a lot of hope, didn't she? That was it. She didn't have anything else. The man of God told her what? That's not so. That is not so. That's not what's going to happen. If you'll do what I tell you, and if you'll obey God, and if you'll go in there, I'm telling you, he's going to mark you for a miracle. And if you read the story, that miracle happened. Now, it had to be a miracle because she didn't even have enough to sustain herself and her son. But we find that they ate. The prophet ate. Her son ate. She ate. When? Until the time that God broke the famine. It was there. Now, there's something important I want you to see about this. There, I, I like prosperity. I believe in prosperity. Nothing wrong with prosperity preaching. But God not, did not give her an oil well. Neither did he give her a grain elevator full of grain. 
And I believe that people who try to preach a gospel that tells you that if you're in need like this lady was, don't worry, God will give you an oil well. Go dig in your backyard. I don't think, I, I think they're missing the point of what God really intends for you to see. The miracle was he believed God, the lady believed God, the oil increased, the meal increased. It was always there and it ran out when the famine was over. Why? They didn't need it any longer. See, so God was, as long as, as she would give to keep his message and messenger alive, so it's important that we keep the message going. Yes. And as long as she kept that going, every time she would return to that mirror bell and that little cruise of oil, another measure was there that she could make three cakes again. Amen. One for the prophet, one for her, and one for the son. And it never ran out. It just kept multiplying. So if you and I, if we will do what is required of us according to the word of God, even when judgment's on the land, even if something is terrible happening and we see things not going the way we really want them in our own lives or our family's life, if we will pray, number one, and if we will cry out against wickedness and be a witness to the lost world, to this God who has a grace and mercy that he desires to reach out and touch them. The one who says, I'm going to heal you if you'll only believe me and put your trust in me. I'll do it for you. Your loved ones will be some of those that can walk through these back doors and run to these altars while the word of God is being sang, not preached. But they'll come when the word is being sung as we're worshiping God. They can be some of those people that will come. And then remember God's house in the vineyard. Pastor does, he says, I don't talk about it much, but it's necessary, and that is to bring all the tithes and offerings to this storehouse, that this ministry can continue so that God's word can continue. See, there's some I know that sit in this house, they, they don't, you don't follow the word of God in all your giving and tithes, and I'm not going to point at you or even look at you. I'll look over everybody's head. But God knows who you are. He knows everything about you. And people are asking, oh, God, why isn't this happening to me? Folks, you got to be faithful to him. If you'll give, he'll keep the fire away from your doorstep. If you don't give, that opens the doorstep up for the enemy to step up there. Remember the Satan that I talked about. He's out to devour anybody and everybody he can. But you can be marked for a miracle. And when the enemy comes and puts his foot on your doorstep, he'll say, whoops, I might as well go down next door. Can't have do anything in this place. Why? Because of the presence of Almighty God. See, God wants to work and mark you for a miracle. And it can happen. So allow the Holy One, the Holy Ghost, the one who lives in you. He said when he comes, he'll lead you, he'll guide you into all truths. The truths are this word. And he'll lead you to these truths. And when he leads you to those truths, he can then direct your life. And you will be, what? Marked for a miracle. If you need a miracle of whatever kind, if you need deliverance as our worship team comes, I want to tell you, we will live and we will live in a happy life in Jesus Christ. And our land can be blessed in America, but we must do our part. We must do our part and watch what God does for us. So if you have not been praying like you should, or maybe you have built a tabernacle of wickedness in your life, something you're trying to hide from everybody, one of these days we're going to find that we come to the house of God and God will reveal sin. God doesn't embarrass anybody, but he's come to the place where he'll uncover those things. And if you've got wickedness in your life, if you've got a place you've been worshiping other idols of sin or uncleanness, guess what? If you turn your life over to God today, he's waiting on you. His arms are open. He knows who you are. He knows where you're at. He knows what you've done. So you have to repent and put your confidence in God. And then he will mark you for a miracle 
and he'll mark you for deliverance in your life. And that's what we want to see God do, right? Touch people's lives, change them, make them more like Jesus.